Here's May. Good evening. This is May Brussel in Carmel, California, broadcast number 491, and is May the 3rd, 1981. Before I get into the bulk of the material this evening, I wanted to tell some of you researchers who subscribe to the tapes or new listeners that the magazine, the um, it's an independent little journal printed by Mr. Edmund Berkeley in uh, New England and Massachusetts, Newtonville, Massachusetts, is back in the publishing business again. He started a series of magazines. His magazine is called People and the Pursuit of Truth. And Edmund Berkeley was always a computer specialist writing a trade magazine for computer people. And years ago, he got on to the conspiracy that killed John Kennedy and then Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King and Watergate. And he had a wonderful newsletter that stopped for about a year and a half, and he's publishing again. And if you want the address, you can write to me or call, or if you can remember it, it's Berkeley, like Berkeley University, the city of Berkeley, Berkeley Enterprises, 815 Washington Street, Newtonville, Massachusetts, 02160. This is the beginning of his newsletter again, and the first issue has information about Robert Blakey and how he covered up the investigation of the assassination of John Kennedy and Martin Luther King. The second time it was to be investigated by the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Robert Blakey was brought in and still covered up the uh, conspiracy and the CIA involvement. And it's a very interesting newsletter. The man has a lot of integrity. He takes uh, articles from the various researchers around the country, and it's worthwhile to subscribe to if you've never heard of it. And for those of you who have, uh, you can start taking it again. They're back into business again. I do want to mention a local matter, which I don't usually do on this program because the tapes go far away and it doesn't concern people out of the city, but I don't want local people to lose sight of the fact that the trial of Russell Little of the SLA, the famous SLA, is taking place in uh, Salinas right now at the Superior Court. He was charged for killing Dr. Marcus Foster, along with his buddy, Mr. Romero, and uh, the trial, the first time he was um, convicted of killing the superintendent of the schools up in Oakland, one a uh, man was shot with cyanide bullets. That was Dr. Foster. He was a black man, the superintendent of schools. And his friend, Mr. Blackburn, was shot by a different uh, type of bullet. And his friend lived. The white man lived, and the black man died. They had the mixed bullets. And it's an interesting trial. I wrote uh, a long time ago, seven years ago, the SLA is the CIA. And I'm going to do maybe one whole evening on this and update you on the trial. But I think... Uh, if you live in the local area and you can get off, go call the Superior Court at 8 in the morning or later and see if there's a morning session. If there is, it starts at 9 in the morning or the afternoons are at 1 o'clock. Every day but Friday, I'll be out there tomorrow when I was out last week and the week before, and I'm going to try to take in as many days as I can. The uh, trial of Joseph Romero and Russell Little is important because uh, just as I read on the air last week, the article from the Washington Post on the declaration of war that came out of Washington, D.C., by a far right, uh, farther right than the Nazis, if there is such a thing, they, at least the group that are organized right now, a fanatic, religious fanatic, who's going to begin a series of assassinations and has teams throughout the country to do assassinations. I had written that the first declaration of war against the people in the United States was right here in the Bay Area when the SLA was formed and went into a chronology of events that led to the kidnapping of Patty Hearst. But Russell Little was just one member that was recruited in Florida from a conservative white family who came out to California, went right into the prisons with Donald DeFries and into Vacaville, along with Emily and William Harris, who came out from Indiana, Bloomington, Indiana, and so forth. Um, the trial is fantastic for the things they don't cover and for the uh, laid-back, easy way it goes. Dr. Marcus Foster, his name isn't even hardly mentioned. And there's an interplay of personalities that's very interesting. Russell Little's mother came out here from Florida uh, last week, the week before, to watch for about three weeks of the trial, and she was complaining on how terrible it was that her son, who was such a fine Christian, brought up in such a nice home, 
came out to the Bay Area, got mixed up with all those terrible hippies and those people with tambourines. And I couldn't resist saying to her that tambourines don't kill people. Maybe a little cruel, but that's the fact of life. And then you go back in the courtroom and hear about the possessions in his home of the cyanide bullets and the hollowed bullets and the mechanisms of hollowing them out and putting the cyanide in and the crummy activities that these people were into and um, the uh, displacement of them coming to Florida to rearrange prisoners' lives in California or uh, the United Farm Workers and the Venceremos and the United Prisoners Union. These people came from the east, a lot of them from Philadelphia, Florida, and Indiana, as part of the Operation Chaos and COINTEL program to break up the radical movements in the Bay Area, and were very useful in doing just that. An important part of that chronology of these people was that uh, several days or weeks before Dr. Marcus Foster was shot, the American Nazi Party was handing out notices at a shopping center in San Leandro that Dr. Marcus Foster would be murdered. They said he, that uh, this was going to take place, and they had pamphlets, and on the pamphlets they handed out, they said there might be shotgun blasts into the guts of mixed master principals and superintendents, meaning one black and one white. And this was the American Nazi Party. And um, right after that, that was October 1973. And November 6, 1973, Dr. Foster, who was black, did have the cyanide bullets. And Robert Blackburn, who was white, had regular bullets and survived. But were these fellows individuals who uh, were independent Nazis, such as John Hinckley, who shot at Ronald Reagan, and we'll go into the shootout in Washington in a few minutes and continue on that story. No, because they were allowed into the prisons. They worked with Colston Westbrook of the CIA. They worked with Donald DeFries from the Los Angeles Police Department. And organizing in 1971 down in San Diego was Donald Segretti, who was paid by Clement Stone. I mentioned him before as, as very much part of the Hinckley operation, the, the Regan uh, cover-up, and, and into the middle of the Texas-Chicago uh, combine of a fascism and a uh, combination of the turning the world Christian and fascist organizations. Uh, Donald DeGretti worked through people like Clement Stone. He worked with the Minutemen in California, with the Secret Army Organization in San Diego. Segretti funded the secret intelligence money. He met with the paramilitary right-wing group. This was the Segretti that worked for Dwight Chapin and, and Richard Nixon at the time of Watergate, when Nixon was caught at Watergate. And at the time, they were planning to kidnap radicals at the Republican convention and send them out of the country. The Minutemen, the Los Angeles Police Department, the Squad 19, the White House through Dwight Chapin, the appointment secretary, and E. Howard Hunt, and James McCord, and uh, these people worked with the Minutemen, they worked with the FBI, they worked with the secret army organizations, and with the Nazi Party. So when the pamphlets are handed out in October of 73 that Dr. Marcus Foster will be assassinated, and when he, in fact, is assassinated, November 6, 1973, and then uh, January the 10th, 1974, Joseph Romero and Russell Little were arrested and charged with the murder of Dr. Foster. But they weren't just independent. That's a point I want to make any more than John Hinckley. The background of Little is important, where he came from, where Colston Westbrook came from, where Angela and Gary Atwood and Willie Wolf, the whole can of worms were well-trained agents with a lot of uh, security to carry out the kidnapping of Patty Hearst and to infiltrate all the organizations, the American Indian Movement and all the labor movements that were working in the Berkeley, San Francisco area and as far down as the Monterey Peninsula. Uh, I got out a letter to take to the trial tomorrow for Mrs. Little. She's a very nice, kind of confused, innocent woman who, who doesn't understand what culture produces the kind of kid that's been in jail seven years so far and is on trial again for this murder. I have a letter that um, Russell Little wrote at the time that I wrote my article for the Berkeley Barb on the SLA. Is this, well, this was an article saying, is Donald DeFries the first black Lee Harvey Oswald? And it came out two weeks before they were the six of them were killed by the SWAT team 
in Los Angeles, which I also anticipated and went into the organization of the SLA. Um, I hope this is okay to read some of this on the air. I won't read it all, but he wrote to KPFA and uh, complained about this article in the Barb and wrote to Mark Schwartz. He said, Mark, I'm extremely angry, very angry, and read this with feeling. I just read the Barb April 19 uh, to uh, April 25th issue by Mae Brussel. That dizzy bitch can kiss my ass. Before I get off on her BS, I've got a question for you. She quotes letters out of death row. Who is sending these? How does she get a hold of them? That pompous bitch has the nerve to call Jonathan Jackson a patsy. Jonathan Jackson was the young person who was shot at the Marin County um, shootout when the Judge Haley was murdered, and that was set up by the LAPD and the same criminal conspiracy section that had hired to freeze later for the SLA job. He said, I hope she drops dead tomorrow. And he, he says, I question her trying to put the SLA into the pig conspiracy. And he wrote a four-letter word on repression and resistance. And, uh, oh, it's a nasty letter. How does she dare say that uh, we are part of any kind of operation? But the format of the letter looks like a textbook where he was taught this kind of rhetoric similar to the kind of teachings maybe that John Hinckley got in his courses on Nazism at Lubbock, Texas at the university where he'd memorized Mein Kampf and study labor organizations and concentration camps. Well, I do want to go into the shootout at the old corral. I think that is terribly important, the corral being the Hilton Hotel in Washington, D.C., and the more silent the news media is, the angrier I get about it. But one more item or a couple of items before we get to that is that among all the bad news and the power struggle of Alexander Haig and the talk of World War III, there are journalists and newspapers and people now moving, uh, catching on to Haig and Weinberger and Walter Stessel and uh, Mr. Allen and Mr. Casey and that clique around Richard Nixon and the rhetoric of Nixon uh, getting the Russians for you know, the first 30 days in the administration and then after that just pounding away. But there are some articles, and I don't mean single columns or letters to the editor, but what I noticed last week is that there were three almost uh, half, entire half-page articles, and I'll read you the titles, and one a full-page ad for the New York Times, which I think is beginning to show the sentiments of some people. One was April 26th for the New York Times, and the large uh, headline type was, Some Mavericks Question the Relevance of Armed Forces Strategy and Hardware. Is a gung-ho the way to go? And finally, this was a half page that some are questioning the relevance of the things that the Pentagon wants. Another article from the Los Angeles Times, a full half page on the 29th of April, Foreign policy should consist of more than anti-Sovietism. This is all we're getting. And very interesting distinctions of uh, some serious problems. Very good articles, a half page. Another one, again from the New York Times, entire half page, April 26. There may be more to foreign policy than stopping the Soviets. It sounds like the other one above, but one's the New York Times and one's the Los Angeles Times, one written by James Chase, another by Bernard Gwertzman. Uh And then this article is titled also Disputing the Vicar. Alexander Haig calls himself the vicar of the United States. Uh, his brother is a um, priest at uh, Loyola in Washington, D.C., and he's on the board of directors there, a Catholic priest. But he refers to himself as the vicar of the United States. And then... Finally, a full-page ad in the New York Times. And if you have your pencil, write this address down because you should be used to having a pencil. If you listen to me on the air, if not, you can call or write me a letter and get it. It's a full-page ad in the New York Times, Sunday, April 26, written by William Myers and Joseph Schwartz, called Coalition for a Decent USA. The address, you can send a contribution, and I'll tell you what it is about, 420 Lexington Avenue, room 2060, New York, New York, 10017, 
And there's a cartoon, a large cartoon of Casper Weinberger, Secretary of Defense, and Ronald Reagan, and George Bush and Alexander Haig, and they're playing with war toys, and they're winding them up. And then on the floor, they have their toys uh, moving about. But the thing that impressed me about the full-page ad was a list of questions, and it appealed to me because my objection to many of the movements that are going today uh, today there was a demonstration against El Salvador. Tomorrow it'll be Save the Whales. The next day it's against a nuclear plant down in San Luis Obispo or Rhode Island or you name it. Uh, another time against the nuclear weapons up at Lawrence Livermore Lab. And people are not capable of confronting the entire fabric of the problems as a total problem and face what the problems are and the people behind them. I talk every week on this program about the people behind the problems and how they cause the problems. But this ad for Coalition, Coalition for a Decent USA, I'll read you some of the things they say, but the final sentence they ask is, can a president who is basically a decent man pursue policies that are not? And they make several points. They brought out the inflation that is going to eat away your pocketbook and your life savings, the billions that are put on armaments, that the most inflationary kind of uh, purchasing is spending on weapons where no consumer goods or services are used. They ask, how do you stop inflation to spend billions on the military, and how do you help by cutting social programs? How is that anti-inflationary? Where does it help? Are nuclear wars fightable? Are they winnable? You know, for the Pentagon to say, we'll settle for 20 million dead. Who is to decide which ones are the 20 millions? And is that a victory? Uh, is it winnable at all? Do our leaders toy with our lives and not their own when they talk of winning a nuclear war by letting 20 million die? Are we more secure today after decades of producing nuclear weapons? The argument for having them was, that they make us secure. Are we more secure now that we have them and we've dropped it? Now, well, South Africa has it, and if Libya has one, and Syria, and Pakistan, and India, and Argentina, and Brazil, and you go on and on, are you going to be secure because they have them? They said, would we be more secure if we straightened our economy and strengthened it and got it going instead? Would it be more decent to use armament billions to fight hunger and poverty, to fight hunger and poverty in the world? And this is the contradiction I spent so much time with on the air last week talking about S, the Werner Earhart program, or World Vision, or these great food programs that bring in a few grains to people and leave and promise them a happy road to the next life, you know, an easier passage. Uh, through death and starvation without giving them the means of controlling their own uh, life and their production and taking the things from their earth, the minerals and earth, back for their own houses and schools instead of flying in like great angels and dropping some seeds into their hungry mouth. And the more devout, the more religious the church group, the more they support the radical right that wants the weapons and the armaments that keep these countries impoverished we sell them any kind of piece of junk or hardware, whether we need it or not, and sell them the Bibles and the church with it and the missionaries that turn them Christian before they die. And they ask the question, these people, a coalition for a decent USA, is it more decent to use armament billions for fighting hunger and poverty? Then they said, should we challenge the Soviet Union to join in a campaign of escalation of weapons or... Do we want to match weapon for weapon? Does this make sense? Does our government care that small business will be going bankrupt because of high record, uh, record high interest and mortgage rates? We can't buy a house. You can't rent an apartment. Our savings are jeopardized by the losses suffered in the savings institutions. More businesses are going under. Will the oil companies and use their profits to buy up our businesses as they go under. This is what Chase Manhattan, Rockefeller, and various banks did during the Depression. When the farmers migrated and moved and left those farms, they bought up those farms. And the businesses that thrive, this coalition says, are the oil companies and the military hardware, and do they control these prices 
to buy up our bankrupt businesses. Is there a serious threat to the environment having people like James G. Watt for Interior Secretary and Ann Gorsuch as Administrator of the Environmental Agency? Will the cuts in welfare be counterproductive? Will the working poor have no incentive and put them back on full-time welfare? Should the government, should our government be abandoning cities, education, housing, health, transportation, the minorities, and tell us to fend for themselves. Now, I'm reading all of this to you because it hits many of the basic things that I see happening by the systematic assassination of particular people who would not allow these things to escalate. We have permitted butchers to get into office who have no regard for your oil prices, your energy, your utilities, your savings, your bank accounts, your health, your housing, your education, your clean air, your transportation. They're taking away the Amtrak, the funds for the Amtrak, they raise the price of the airplane ticket. Uh, we'll be cut off from each other by taking the means of getting to each other away from us. And what is accomplished, and they ask the question at the end, can a president who is basically a decent man pursue this kind of a uh, escalation? Now, you have to go under the assumption that maybe Ronald Reagan is basically a decent man, but maybe we have to do a little bit more homework into where Ronald Reagan came from. Uh, in the meantime, you can write to Coalition for a Decent USA. I hope they're not a CIA front. I wouldn't know. I don't know who these people are. And sometimes these things that sound too good to be true are simply vacuums that take your name. But you might send them $1 or $5 or ask for literature. Coalition, Coalition for a Decent USA, 420 Lexington Avenue, room 2060, New York, New York, 10017. There's one thing I know is that if the leaders aren't decent, then the people have to take their life into their own hands. So if you uh, are not treated fairly, there's no way to impeach them unless you catch them in crimes again, such as Richard Nixon, and pull out some of the current crimes or the past crimes. But if they control the Justice Department and the CIA and the FBI tight enough, and you can't break through, that it's up to the people to get together. And I suggest trying writing uh, to this organization and see what it's about, because certainly we need a coalition for a decent USA. It's terribly important. Now, the question of whether Reagan is a decent man or not, you can shoot a man who's not decent because you want someone who's worse, goes back to a program I did a while ago on Ronald Reagan's coming to power and how he came to power, and I promise to do more. There's a few missing pieces in the Ronald Reagan story and in the people around him. One of the men that helped uh, his career that discovered him died last week, April the 29th, 1981. William Meikljohn, M-E-A-I-K-E-L-J-O-H-N. Meikljohn was a talent scout. He uh, searched some such people such as Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney, and he discovered Ronald Reagan. He died last week, as I say, and he went around the country. He began his career before he knew Regan. In 1930, he joined the Music Corporation of America. Now, in 1919, Germany started rearming, and by 1920, the United States multinationals, Henry Ford and U.S. Steel and the Mellons and the DuPonts, were arming Hitler for the war against the Soviet Union. As soon as the revolution was over and Herbert Hoover, Hoover came home from Europe after dispensing money to these armies to get ready for World War II, uh, we were, the Germans in their mind were going to get ready for World War II. And certainly by the 1930s, we were well into funding and thinking in terms of World War II to make war against Russia and uh, arming what was the Nazi party and Mussolini in Italy and Adolf Hitler in Germany. By 1936, Franco was uh, given support during a brutal war by Mussolini and Hitler and took over Spain. Well, Michael John worked 
in Hollywood. He worked for Music Corporation of America. So to unlock certain pictures of Ronald Reagan, we have to go back and do more work into what Music Corporation was in 1930. We know at the time of Watergate, John Mitchell and Martha Mitchell and all the Republicans were at a party given by Music Corporation of America, and they've been very far, far right organization for many years. But how political they were in 1930s, when Meagle John worked for them, I don't know. Uh, he went into 1940, he started working for Paramount Picture. But it's interesting, among the people he discovered, one was Lucille Ball, who became a very conservative Republican through her career. And the other was Alan Ladd, who uh, became a director of 20th Century Fox, which is a intertangling can of worms uh, with the purchase of Fox Studio by Marvin Gaye from Denver, Colorado, that I uh, go into in bits and pieces. But Alan Ladd was one of the people he discovered. And he got a uh, introduction. Uh, Ronald Reagan was a radio announcer in Des Moines, Iowa in 1937. That was right after the, was in the period of the Spanish Civil War, actually in the period where several years before Hitler was to invade Poland, two years before. And um, Ronald Reagan was in Des Moines, Iowa, and uh, a woman named Joy Hodges contacted Bill Meeklejohn to meet Ronald Reagan and give him a screen test. Uh, they compared him to another Robert Taylor, and he was flown out to Warner Brothers and got $200 a week contract at Warner Brothers that began the career of Ronald Reagan. Um, it's an interesting career from the radio announcer to Hollywood, and after he was at Warner Brothers Studio in 1940, 1942, he made movies with Errol Flynn, who, according to Charles Hyam, was deep into the Gestapo, working with German counterintelligence with many stars in Hollywood, and you have to read Errol Flynn, The Untold Story of Charles Hyam, and the years of Flynn's work with the Gestapo and the Nazis, and make an overlay of the work that he did on two movies with Ronald Reagan. They were very much part of the social set together in Hollywood. So um, if we're working with a nice man, uh, it's a good question. Can a president who's basically a decent man pursue policies that are not? But if we're working with a man who uh, was on the fringe of the radical fascists and then working with the outright fascists from the Hoover Institute and in California through his entire career as he escalated into the political picture, then we're obviously working with somebody whose best interests are against the people of the United States. It, it, our foreign policy, I think, has been misdirected and the funds and intent gone the wrong way, as these columnists are now finding out and realizing. But the important thing is, how far ahead were people like Adolf Hitler or Ronald Reagan or Richard Nixon selected for the role and groomed by corporations like General Electric or Music Corporation of America? Or they picked years before and put into strategic places as their careers escalated. Uh, in a few minutes, I'll go into bits and pieces of Alexander Haig's career. And a recent author about Haig said that he wasn't just a half-assed, haphazard kind of an escalation where he's in the right time and right place. He's been manipulative ever since he was at West Point and jumped over these people, uh, hand-plucked right to Douglas MacArthur's side over in Asia you know, at the time uh, that important decisions and treaties were being signed. He went right out of his classmates group into the very important top people. He just made that giant leap, and he's stayed there ever since. Um, getting Before I get to Haig again, and this does all tie into the Hinckley picture and foreign policy that I'm going into in Guatemala and other places and the Vanderbilt Energy and the general uh, kind of power, the manipulations behind the scene of people that are strategically placed and move up, such as Russell Little at the time of the SLA and the Nazis and the Republicans and William Colby, who formed the SLA, working with counterintelligence and Nazis and then young people appearing uh, as lone independents, just taking, in quotes, a political stand and having shootouts, whether they're in California or Washington. It's the same kind of organization that is between them so they're not far apart. 
It's the end of the first half hour. We'll go on to John Hinckley and others in one minute. We'll take a one-minute break. This is Mae Russell in Carmel, California. M102, KLRB. And now back to part two of World Watchers International. Okay, then. incidentally, on the newsstands right now, it's May uh, 1981. I don't like to advertise these magazines for some of the things they have in there, but Penthouse is uh, a series of articles that somebody told me about, and there's one on Jonestown this month, and there's one on the Bilderberger, the infiltration by a writer, Craig Carpell, who got into the Bilderberger in 19, the last meeting in 1980, and talks about that, and there's an article in this issue also on cloning. The important thing, I think, of the Bilderberger meetings that he attended, the one that he attended, was that uh, the people who run and push or make major decisions around the world of foreign policies, really who lives and who dies and who's conquered, uh, they may have had the strength to make those opinions a long time ago and sit at a board and rearranges like uh, people on a chessboard is to be moved back and forth, and most of us being the pawns. But uh, the situation, the international situation, has even gotten out of their control, so that by the time this Craig Carpell infiltrated the Bilderbergers of 1980, he came to the conclusion that the bulk of the meetings are trying to decide how to handle problems that have arisen, not how to create their own uh, consensus and move countries. Years ago when they started, they could look at a map and say, what are we going to do with Iran? Well, we don't like Mossadegh. You know, we'll put in the Shah. What are we doing in Guatemala? Or, or what, how should we support Nicaragua, Samosa? And they can send in assassination teams if they don't like Fidel Castro. But everything they plan doesn't always go as according to plan. And now the world seems to be way out of their control. I can't even believe that a group as broad as the Bilderbergers in trying to cover all the bases can trouble, cover all the troubles that are going on today in the world. If you just take the headlines from this week in the newspapers with the imminent death of Bobby Sands and the conflict of the IRA in Great Britain, the sabotage of the airplane that Mrs. Gandhi was going to be on, um, and the Mrs. Thatcher had just been in India, and they said there's evidence that Americans were involved in sabotage. This came over the radio from Europe, the shortwave radio. The money pouring into Iraq, funding uh, Iran, and if Iran goes to the Soviet Union, uh, the United States will have to face the two of them if we want to take them on. There's problems with Israel uh, fighting Lebanon, and now uh, Sadat is saying all the Arab nations should gang up and be firm against Israel, where he just signed a peace uh, pact a while back. Uh, there was a coup in Spain, and, and the king objected. He accused the CIA of being behind it and forced General Haig to go there. I don't call him Secretary of the State. I call him General Haig to go there for an extra 22 hours on his trip to Europe just a week ago. Uh, there's many problems, uh, conflicts in South Africa, the United Nations turning against uh, our own ambassador. And uh, even today, I was surprised the World Affairs Council had uh, their annual meeting, which is on the Monterey Peninsula, the, the California West Coast branch of the World Affairs Council, and they were castigating our lady ambassador of the United Nations for her positions and really chewing her out. She was supposed to be here for the conferences and couldn't be here, but uh, they wished that she had been here. And they were criticizing her strongly in her positions, and it was in the paper today. So the very conservative World Affairs Council isn't even putting up with the kind of behavior that she's displaying, uh, meeting secretly with the African intelligence and uh, going running to South Africa and her vote in the United Nations this week. So a body of audience, I understand, got a round of applause for not approving of American policy and referring to our uh, representative of the U.N. as being a clown. We can't watch Morocco. I was reading this week about the war in Morocco against Mauritania. And uh, will India produce an atomic bomb? The United States is going to send billions to Pakistan. The United States is going to try to assume, along with a few allies, the debt of millions and millions from Poland. 
The Green Berets are fighting in Liberia. Where the U.S. arms are being shipped again to South Korea. The Khmer Rouge are being funded by the CIA in Cambodia, if you like that one. Uh, how do you handle the, these things? The guerrillas are on the way to the Dominican Republic. Allegedly, the Dominican Republic, they were picked up by the Alpha 66, anti-Castro Cubans, uh, probably going to Cuba. And uh, Alexander Haig, as I said, flying to Italy this week to explain why we uh, decided to sell grain to the Soviet Union when we told our allies they couldn't. So then they're going to start selling and there'll be competition. And we've been apologizing and paying off Japan. Uh, now it's $4 million. Soon it'll be 8 for sinking their submarine. Each one of these is a major crisis. So there's no... Uh, one authority that can handle all these countries and say, I am in control. It looks, and this should make you happy, that in spite of the fact that the best plans were made by a group of fools to think that they could control all these countries, it looks like they couldn't possibly control all these countries. Alexander Haig tells Saudi Arabia, we'll send you uh, these AWACS, these airplanes, and Israel complains, um, no, you can't do that. We need them, too, and we promise Saudi Arabia will send you the pilots to fly them and then tell the Israelis, well, if they come over your country, you can shoot them down, and then we're shooting American pilots flying for Saudi Arabia. So those are just a few countries. To give you an idea, in case you're afraid that my broadcasts are doom and gloom each week, I do want to cheer you up to the fact that those people who cause so much pain in all these different countries are really not in control of the people or themselves. It's perfectly obvious that the system of supplying weapons and guns and ammunition is bankrupting every major country into this terrible inflation, whether it's Great Britain or Israel, Brazil, Argentina, United States, Germany. Uh, it's not working, and they have to come up with something better. And the sooner they do it, uh, without causing wars to disguise what is happening. But I sincerely feel that if they called a war, they'd have trouble getting people to go, even if they disguised it as a provocation of the uh, Soviet Union. Our allies would know it wasn't, and I think they would recognize the lies and wouldn't want to die about this. Now, the important news in my mind, and that's a lot of news, I'm rattling off, as I say, countries and incidences that deserve many, many more hours of explanation. But that John Hinckley shooting at the old corral at the Hilton Hotel is just too silent for May Brussels. If not for you, I don't like it. Uh, we're told that there was that one madman who shot four people and hurt them terribly in Washington, D.C. on March the 30th of this year. And there's still a question of whether there were two or more people shooting. Four people were gunned down like hunting victims. And the president was dragged in by the armpits into that hospital, bleeding out of the nose and mouth. We don't hear a word about uh, John Hinckley. He hasn't been charged for shooting the press secretary. And that poor Mr. James Brady is critically ill, uh, facing maybe another surgery. Half the brain was gone, and he seems to be struggling and is in terrible pain. Uh, that Tim McCarthy, who was in serious condition and released, hit in the abdomen, is out. We haven't heard about Thomas Delahanty, who got the bullet in the neck and had that close surgery uh, for fear that it would explode inside his body. Uh, you saw television. You saw them gunned down. They replayed it over and over. And this is interesting for students of the assassinations and the attempted murder of President of the United States. And we don't know how he will go through this one yet. Uh, it's interesting because you maybe you weren't around at Dallas 17 years ago and you don't remember, or in 68 when Robert Kennedy was shot, or in 1968 when Martin Luther King was killed, or even when Patty Hearst was kidnapped with the SLA or the Manson family story that came out. There have been so many hoaxes and confusions, and now you can see for yourself the silencing uh, that goes on when this person is... A uh, known member of the Nazi party, kicked out for being too violent, taken to an American military base and then to a known mind control center, and we don't hear a word. Now, it's been weeks since the president has, was shot. This is May the 3rd. He was shot 30th of March. He was visiting with Prince Charles this week. 
And according to Associated Press story, and you can see it in the movies, Ronald Reagan is limping. And until the shootout, we didn't see a limp or any side of a limp. And this week, Regan told Prince Charles that his slight limp recently is from an old break in his thigh. It had nothing to do with falling off of horses. But in the physical examination of the story of this perfect specimen, this perfect 70-year-old specimen, before the shootout at the old corral, we didn't see him limping, and now he's having trouble with his thigh. Another important article by Maxine Cheshire, she has one every week in the Washington Post. If you get to read her column, it's very significant. And she was talking about the controversy of whether Ronald Reagan could take a little vacation because it, you know, it gets hot in Washington in the summer. He wants to come out to Santa Barbara, his home, or whether he should hang around uh, Camp David and stay in Washington, D.C. And she wrote this week, Those who have been winning the argument to keep him convalescing at the White House and at Camp David feel it would be difficult, if not impossible, to keep him off a horse. Also, some argue that proximity to Washington is important if the public is going to perceive that Regan is still running things. It's important if to perceive that Regan is still running things. It reminds me of the play The Balcony by John Genet. I don't know how many of you saw it or read it about three men in a whorehouse and what, they wear costumes for their acts and get into it and one's a priest and one's a judge and one's a general and then their female companions dress appropriately to the way they uh, are dressed and the town is bombed and they have to quick uh, reassure the people in the town that, that the cardinal is there and that the judge is there and, and that the general is on hand. So the men who are at the whorehouse at the time, the plumber and different people put in, have to go out in the street in a parade in the costumes that they're using for their sexual fantasies and they wave and act appropriately and then the natives are satisfied. So as Maxine Chester says, it's important to perceive that he's still running things. So you might ask, who's running things? If we have to perceive it, then who's running it? Well, uh, there was an article one of my listeners to the tape sent to me this month, March 1981, in the Washington Monthly. I don't know how many of you get that a newsletter out of Washington, D.C., and it's an article about Alexander Haig, who I believe is absolutely the man to watch for who the one who wants to run things. Uh, his getting up anxiously after the assassination attempt and saying the Constitution tells him he was in charge was just kind of a slip because he really knows he wants to be in charge. And the article on Haig came out, as I say, in March, so it had to be printed uh, or ready to go to print a month before, at least a month in a small newsletter letter like this, uh, before the shootout at the Hilton. And it's about the personality of Alexander Haig, and it warns about his wanting to be ambitious and work his way up. And in conclusion, the article says that he he lost uh, the vice president, running for the presidency, he wanted to be the president, he didn't even make it the primaries. But watch Alexander Haig, because not only a secretary of defense, but he has slots that he wants to fill. That's, in effect, what it's saying, that he wants to move up. And it goes into the biography of Forget Those Stories About Loyal Al Haig. This is from the article in Washington Monthly. It's misleading. He looks the part of a military man that's assigned to him. He looks like he would take orders and be commander-in-chief. But this author says, try listening to him instead of looking. Listen to the way he uses his words in public. His Look at his career and review his career and see if you see a different, stranger truth that doesn't emerge. It's a curious thing that goes beyond authority. People at West Point obey orders and take or authority, but Haig is not of that ilk. And it goes on to say that they were trained in West Point with the old honor, obey, and duty, the military values of honor, obey, and duty to your country. And he warns that Haig is of the post-war managerial ethic. That is the Reinhard Galen, Hitler's chief of intelligence, that formed our CIA. He formed the mentality for men like Haig, who go from the Defense Department, Defense Intelligence Agency, National Security Agency, CIA. It's not your duty and your country. It's 
how you roll yourself from one place to the other in order to be in those strategic locations. And this article tells about his Philadelphia uh, birthplace. His father was an attorney who died when Haig was young. And remember, if you want them, you can order a back tape I've done on the Philadelphia connections to the past assassinations and conspiracies. He went to West Point, and then he went to Japan. He, right after West Point, the vicar of Americans' foreign policy, and he questions this too, the right to say he's the vicar of that, uh, went right to Japan where he was under Douglas MacArthur. He graduated 214th out of a class of 310. So he was 68th or so from the bottom of his class at West Point, but went, graduated in 1947, the year that the CIA was formed, the National Security Council, and the CIA, and was flown immediately to Douglas MacArthur. And the author said you would expect that he'd be on the personnel staff and have uh, some job placement uh, knack and so forth. But Haig went with a man named Jonathan Ladd, L-A-D-D, -D, Jonathan Ladd, who later became the commander of the Green Berets. Those were the counterintelligence uh, spies that uh, William Colby headed and had in all of Southeast Asia and then brought home, as I said, to uh, our West Coast to form get their tentacles into the law enforcement in California. But they're all over the world. Jonathan Ladd uh, went with Haig, and they would, went out with MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur, immediately after his graduation in 1947. And then when Chiang Kai-shek evacuated the mainland of China, Hagen Land went immediately to Taiwan to Chiang Kai-shek, and one of the main officers on the compound post for, at Taiwan for Chiang Kai-shek's arrival and assimilation into that location was a General Alonzo Fox. And by 1950, Haig had married his daughter, Patricia. So by 1947, when the National Security Council was formed, Haig was out of West Point and on his way with Douglas MacArthur. And in 1950, he had married the woman whose father was at Taiwan in charge of assimilating Chiang Kai-shek into that modus operandi. Uh, there's a book called Self-Destruction written by a man with a pseudonym. He uses the name Cincinnatus. He's an army officer who writes in the book Self-Destruction uh, that in the wake of the war after 1945 when World War II was over and he was in the army, duty, honor, and country were replaced by something different, a need to be in the right place at the right time. That means that your duty and your honor and your country don't matter. You had strategic agents formed. We had the OSS that informed us of uh, spies or danger from overseas that didn't too, do too well during, uh, certainly at Pearl Harbor, which we knew about in advance. But we formed the CIA starting in 45 and had the National Security Council, National Security Agency in 47 when he got out of West Point and he leaps to Douglas MacArthur in Southeast Asia. He's over in Taiwan with Chiang Kai-shek. And uh, careerism, rather than dedication to one's men, was the way to get ahead. Now, that is the point uh, when I began with the uh, program, the Coalition for a Decent CIA, for a Decent USA, not CIA, uh, asking the question, does Alexander Haig or do these people in control really want a decent uh, USA is duty, honor, and country something that is passe, that they use their experiences to further the power of this fascism which they are ushering in. Haig was instrumental in landing at Incheon in South Korea on Douglas MacArthur's forces. And just recently, again, Maxine Cheshire has an article that the movie on Incheon, it's a $46 million glorifying this Korean adventure, is funded by Reverend Moon and a producer in um, Japan, a member of the Unification Church with unlimited money, millions of dollars. And they used our Marine Corps, our Pentagon, our Army, United States Army, to help make this movie of the landing over in South Korea. And Reverend Moon and his gang have put up this money. Now, I got information a long time ago that the money for Reverend Moon came 
from uh, from Nazi money that was taken out of Germany when, at the end of the war, 1945, when Hitler collapsed, to make a resurgence for World War III using these funds. And Alexander Haig was in Southeast Asia with MacArthur. He was uh, in South Korea. He's working with Reverend Moon and uh, that gang from the Pentagon in making and glorifying this and work with Chiang Kai-shek, which means that the narcotics that funded through Chiang Kai-shek's operation in China and then continued from Taiwan could go into the resurgence and people of uh, the ilk of Reverend Moon who come out making movies like this for $46 million. Remember, he's the man who put up all that money for ads at the time that... Um, Nixon was going to be indicted for Watergate and was under suspicion. Incidentally, Alexander Haig works or had worked or still does for United Technology. And there's an account of United Technology in Wall Street Journal just last week, two weeks ago, in case uh, you didn't see it, April 15th, from Hartford, Connecticut. It said, when Alexander Haig left the presidency of United Technology to become Secretary of State, uh, he made a financial sacrifice. He makes 10% of the salary that he would at United Technology. He was pulling in a salary of $1.3 million. Uh, this is the salary at United Technology, and he's working for just a much less in the Pentagon at this time. But United Technology's profits through the decisions of war, we have to make war against Russia, we have to arm this country, we have to arm that, there, according to the Wall Street Journal, the United Technologies profits went up 15% in this last quarter from 3.3 to 3.33 billion. It used to be 2.89 billion, but in their quarter, just the last quarter, it went to 3.33 billion. And United Technologies is going to make the engines and the motors for the space colonies. And uh, these have been also linked to NASA and Nazis, and I refer to the book Alternative 3 and other indications that a lot of treachery can come out of the building of the space colonies without supervision or people knowing what's going on. Uh, Alexander Haig once made a remark when they asked him, was he going to resign under some recent scandal? He says, I didn't come here just to shuffle papers. This is the kind of remark he makes. But this company, uh, through his help of getting people so war-minded that we have to give contracts to everything that comes along because Russia is taking over the world, and yet the corporation that he was president of in the last quarter made $3.33 billion. And that goes back, uh, I've spent a lot of time on Haig because he's the successor to the John Hinckley story and the shooting if Reagan doesn't survive or get sick. Uh, Haig has the ambition to be the president. If Bush is president, Haig would be handpicked as vice president. They would bypass other people just as Jerry Ford was hand-plucked by Richard Nixon. Uh, in order for this to not happen, people have to be very alert and to uh, uh, watch Haig and his moves, and a lot of columnists are doing that. Uh, one uh, article that was interesting this week on the John Hinckley case, and I will get into more of them next week and leave the international affairs aside, but the international policies are decided by people such as Alexander Haig and, as I say, Walter Stessel, the cabinet that is under Richard Nixon, and uh, when a man is shot or knocked out of the running or immobilized or scared, such as Richard Nixon, then Haig can push these policies. I call him Nixon. Oh, forgive me. I can't tell the difference in my filing, hardly, between Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan. The same people put them into power, the same organizations, the same cliques, uh, the same sleaziness, the, the people behind the deal with the rhetoric of the war and the terrorism. There's so little difference. Uh, but the point is that whether... Richard Nixon is moved out of office and Alexander Haig becomes chief of staff in the White House and is bumping out people like Haldeman and not letting them reach the president and controlling the telephone. And remember, he was acting president at one time, at the time of Watergate, and showed how great he was and wants to be back there. Uh, when these people make such tremendous profits, and when the people, the masses of the people are paying the taxes or are too poor to pay the taxes, have nothing or are scared of having anything and losing it, 
when these people move up and decide foreign policy and domestic policy and conceal the assassins of the men who precede them, then assassination is a good tool for them to assure their power and their profits. In this case, Haig has both. He works for a company that is warfare company, a president of the company, and makes decisions. It was the same way with Henry Kissinger. He's under the pay of David Nelson Rock, a fellow, when he made decisions to overthrow Chile or to have military juntas in other countries and uh, cut off aid to countries that seemed democratic or leftist and support the military dictatorships because the profits are greater for the oil companies if they don't have to pay the native populations. A man shouldn't be Secretary of State such as Henry Kissinger and be on the board of directors of Chase Manhattan working for David Rockefeller and have his wife under the pay of Rockefeller and Haig at working for president of this uh, United Technology and making decisions of foreign policy. And as I mentioned before, and I want to do in the near future as soon as possible, go more into Fritz Kramer, the man from Nazi Germany who discovered Alexander Haig and Henry Kissinger. And the point is that when people from Nazi Germany are selecting our secretaries of state and selecting our foreign policies in the Pentagon, then you and I, the native population, can expect the same treatment they got in Germany, where Hitler can take control of the banks, you can get rampant inflation, the rich stayed rich, they were never poor, and they had their art treasures, and they had their trips and their pleasure palaces, and they knew the banking procedures if they lost the war to retrench. They had the guarantee of the Allies. We wouldn't bomb their very important factories and the ITT factories that were making airplanes for Germany at the time. They were in the United States making wire and telephone poles for the United States. They controlled their profits while the small banks, the small businesses go under and the people get strangled. And it's very important to see the kind of president you have, the kind of cabinets they have, because what they did in the past is what you can expect for yourself. And the people that put them in, if you look at their lifestyles and read what they say and how they say it and how they acted, there's no reason to think you can't expect the same for yourself. Now, in addition, one, I have one minute to go. The silence on the Hinckley case is not only outrageous, but there's an article in the Washington Post this last week that the U.S. Attorney Charles Ruff, who, who would be prosecuting Regan's alleged would-be assassin, is being pushed away, and they're trying to bring in some other attorneys for the prosecution so that he won't be on the job and the people deciding on the legal counsel to take this federal position as U.S. attorney are being selected by Howard Baker of Tennessee and Strom Thurmond and Paul Lexalt and Governor Mathias of Maryland and Barry Goldwater in uh, Arizona. Now, if Mr. Brady dies, it'll be hard to see how Hinckley can get off that case. But with this kind of removing the judge from the case and getting a hand-picked judge, for John Hinckley, plus Edward Bennett Williams of the CIA being his attorney. There is a lot of behind-the-scenes finagling that we'll go into next week. I, I just did want to update some of the international implications of uh, uh, men like Haig that move up through the bullet and can't get their voted in, tied up to strong fascist organizations all of their lives, and now are on the peak of uh, controlling us through their offices in the White House. But we'll go back to Hinckley next week and uh, pick up some of the details of that case. In the meantime, this is Mae Bressel in Carmel, California. You take care, and I'll be back with you next week. This has been World Watchers International with noted conspiracy investigator Mae Brussel. This program originates from Carmel, California.